minutes after detonation, the wind changed direction. Part of the radioactive cloud was blown in the direction of Adelaide. There was a lady here hanging the washing up, looking up in the air to the line and facing the west. And she said she noticed a very unusual reddish brown cloud, huge, stretching for miles and very high. And she thought, that's odd. It didn't look like clouds. Being a farmer and always interested in the weather, this was a strange day. At four o'clock in the afternoon, a grey streaky cloud come over from the northwest and all of a sudden it went completely dark. It wasn't normal and I didn't find out until next day that an atomic bomb had been let off at Marilinga. Hedley Marston got quite angry when, when he read the official pronouncement that um, skilled men working through the night um, had found no evidence of any radioactive material. Uh, my cynical view is that it must have been too dark for them to read their Geiger counters. In the days following the test, Marston took thyroids from sheep at two research stations close to Adelaide. He measured radioactive iodine levels up to 5,000 times higher than normal. The results from Perry Stout's air sampling were equally disturbing. Instead of having counts of around 20 per 100 seconds on a normal day as a result of natural background radiation, he received the day after the bomb test counts of 96,000. The people of Adelaide were never told. The people of the little towns along the way between Maralinga and Adelaide, they were never told. And if they'd read their local paper, they would have read the opposite, that all was well with the tests. Two weeks later, Marston wrote to Mark Oliphant, the Director of Physical Sciences at Titterton's University in Canberra. He detailed an extraordinary admission by Safety Committee Chairman Leslie Martin about how the test had been let off in haste. Dear Mark, Les Martin became quite cock a hoop when I asked him if he had any record of fallout over Adelaide. He said, I can talk with complete authority, there's been no fallout over Adelaide, none whatsoever. When I showed him our observations, he collapsed and stated, no reports regarding the third bomb have been submitted to me. I left this baby to Titterton. It was a very small one. Later, he broke completely and said, the pressure was on, please remember the pressure was on. I'll leave no stone unturned to ensure that the essence of the report is published. His reaction was to make it public and extremely incensed that uh, the physicists involved were just as determined not to have it made public. When Marston threatened to publish his fallout findings, the Australian intelligence service, ASIO, marked his file, scientist of counter-espionage interest. Marston was convinced he was being spied on, that his phone was being tapped and that his mail was being interfered with. My dear David, the secret police had been tampering with my private mail. Perhaps they imagined they could frighten me into silence. I endured this indignity for long enough to obtain complete proof and then asked the people responsible to cease their nonsense or I'd call for a public inquiry. Arrogance and this sort of thing is rapidly changing Anglophiles into Anglophobes. Marston realises that uh, he's in a very dangerous situation. 
Not only are the British wanting to curtail his, the experiments, the uh, security net is closing in. It had become the most politically charged dispute in Australian science. In his report, Marston accused the Safety Committee of lying to the Australian people about fallout. His findings of iodine-131 in sheep and cattle were proof that large areas of the Australian continent had been contaminated. This, he said, would result in increased cases of thyroid cancer in humans. But Marston went further. The presence of iodine-131 in animals, he said, meant that an even more dangerous radioactive isotope had contaminated the food chain, strontium-90. We have low levels of strontium-90 falling out of the atmosphere at that time and landing on the herbage, being eaten by the cow, accumulating like calcium does in the milk of cows, are then in this concentrated form, it's called biological magnification, going down the gullet's children. When humans drink that milk, babies and children in particular, who are laying down bone very quickly, their bones are the places where the strontium and the calcium eventually wind up and once it's there, it doesn't go away again. It stays there with its 29 years half-life. So in 29 years, half the activity is still there. In 58 years, a quarter of the activity is still there. If Marston was correct, strontium-90 uptake would be dramatically increased by government policy, which guaranteed a half pint of milk daily to every school child. There is a very serious likelihood that internal radiation from strontium-90 may, after a latent period of some years, result in many painful deaths from cancer of the bone. Your unequivocal assurance that Marston was now on a collision course with the most powerful forces in the British Commonwealth. If he published his report, as he threatened, it could jeopardise future atomic testing in Australia. The British demanded Marston return their test equipment, and Ernest Titterton, the new head of the Safety Committee, insisted he delete his attacks on the committee's competence and his claims about strontium-90 contamination. Marston had never measured strontium-90, but in his report, he left no doubt where his detractors would find it. He states right at the end of his report, the proof will be found in the bones of children. All one has to do is to examine the strontium-90 load in the bones of deceased people and particularly children in the coming decades to show that I am right. <laughs>